Good evening. Hello, we're all late coming on, but Pastor Kirk ended us pretty quickly. Now, I had a question for you. Yes, sir. Except for tonight, um, the last time you were in on Wednesday was week five. Um, you had originally said that you wanted to take it for credit, but you've, you, you've got to be, you can't miss that many classes. So if you have been viewing those, you hadn't told me. So, oh, on the YouTube. Yeah. Okay. Yes. But um, I thought I just, I only had three that I needed to do on YouTube. Well, the, um, well, it's from, five, you were here for five and, and tonight's 12. So between five and 11 or between six, six and 11, that would be what, five? Oh, no, I did more than that, I thought. So, that so look it a, up and tell me. Yeah, because I, I just, yeah, because I just started a consulting job that was on Wednesdays and they were having problems, but that's only been about three weeks. I'll verify it. Okay. I will so just send me, it. send me an email and let me know. Yes, sir. All right, good. Diana, hi. Hello, awesome. how is everybody? <laughs> I'm fine. I don't know about everybody else. I'm fine. Oh, that's I good. have decided that <clears throat> this voice thing that I keep having, I think it must be allergies. Probably is. I go through the same thing. I just I take did, allergy pills every day. I did have a cold or something a, a few weeks ago, but I this is this has lasted way too long and it's a little different. Um, I'm sort of mildly stopped up, but not heavily, and I'm usually okay, but then all of a sudden I just start coughing. I go and through I the same thing. Yeah. So I, I, and they're talking about pollen is worth, worse in this area this year. Right, right. And it's been pretty windy here, and I'm pretty sure you're going through the same thing in Houston, right? Lots yeah. of wind and rain. Yeah, that just adds to it. Yeah, and we've seen, um, I don't know what they're called, but there are these things that have, from the trees, and um, there's been more of those than I have ever remember seeing. Uh, I haven't been here forever, but the last few years, I've never seen, seen this much, and I, I saw an article recently that talked about um, allergies. Allergies are worse this year, so... Yeah, are those little things that they like little white cotton things floating through the air? Well, in this case, they're they're sort of a tan colored, and if you see them individually, they're just individual things. But it seems like when they come down, they it's almost as if they're attracted to each other. They get in your gutters. They're but right yeah. now they're 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 disappearing. So I don't I don't know what it is exactly. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. I, I see some of those here. Yeah. Yeah, we're dealing with allergies. Oh, I, yeah, I ought to be. Every, every week I tell myself this, I need to be checking people off. Hi, Brother Jim. Um, just curious, how many more weeks of class do we have left? I forgot. Uh, the last class is on uh, May 4th. So counting tonight, there are four weeks. Okay, thank you. I don't know if any of you can hear it, but uh, the um, ice cream 
ice cream truck is going to, is coming down our street playing a tune to attract kids to um, get some ice cream stop now so i don't know okay it's time to begin and um Tonight we're going to be in Acts 18 and 19. Let's, uh, let's begin with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power and the wonder of your word and how this word points us to Jesus, the way, the way to you and the way for the way to life and the way for us. And uh, Father, we ask that you would help us always to um, devote ourselves wholeheartedly to, um, to you and to what you have done in, in the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Okay, last week, we ended with uh, Paul in Athens. Uh, Paul gives a, I think, a brilliant, brilliant sermon there, but the, but the most of the hearers are not terribly receptive. And when he comes to the part about resurrection, as is nearly predictable for a bunch of Greeks, they scoff at the message because they didn't believe in resurrection. When you're dead, you're like Rover, you're dead all over. You, the, and, and there's no there's no possibility of a resurrection, not of Jesus, not of us. Um, they, they could buy the idea of the immortality of the soul, but not the resurrection of the body. And so when he gets to the end of his uh, sermon and speaks of Jesus being raised from the dead, that's just too much for them. And... Uh, some scoff, some say, well, this is interesting, we'll listen to you again, but the impression, the impression we get is that they weren't really serious, but there were some who joined Paul and believed, so there was, a, there was a small group that he connected with. Then we pick up in chapter 18, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went, uh, and he went to see them. And because uh, he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So Paul leaves Athens, and he goes to Corinth. Corinth is on the, an isthmus between the mainland of Greece and the uh, Pe Peloponnesus, um, where Sparta, where Sparta was. Um, Corinth ha had a long history of ups and downs. It had been a, a, a very um, influential, prosperous city that had rebelled against Rome after the Romans took over. Uh, I mean, if you go all the way back, they were, uh, they were a very strong city, but they were dominated by the Athenians. And when the Athenians were uh, defeated by the Spartans in the Peloponnesian Wars, uh, Corinth fell into hard times, uh, but they tended, they tended to come back. The Romans came and conquered. The, uh, the Corinthians were part of a rebellion against the Romans, and so the Romans came and just totally razed the city. They, they just totally destroyed it. But then <clears throat> later it was rebuilt, and by the time Paul is in Corinth, it's probably a city of 200,000. And um, it is prosperous. 
um, and part part of the prosperity comes from the fact that it's in the on this isthmus, and um, ships would come would come in there, and they would actually uh, haul them across across the isthmus um, on on logs as rollers, and there, and you say why would they do that? That's a lot of work. Well, it was it was it was a lot of work, but it was safer than going around the the southern tip of uh, of Greece, which could be treacherous, especially at certain times of the year. And um, so, a lot of trade came. In other words, a lot of trade, both land up and down through Greece and and across the uh, across the oceans or the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and um, and so it was prosperous. Also, Corinth was no well. Corinth had the temple to Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love, and um, immorality was just part of part of her worship. Uh, the Corinthians, e even before this time, a a term had been coined called to Corinthianize. To Corinthianize meant to, to be sexually immoral. Why? And so there was a saying among sailors, it's not for every man to, to uh, go to Corinth. So this was not a, I mean, this, <laughs> this, this was far from uh, anything Christian or even uh, Jewish in orientation. Um, so Paul goes there, uh, there he finds a Jew by the name of Aquila from Pontus, which is in modern day Turkey in that general area. Um, and it says he's from Pontus, but he recently came from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. This is in, in this general passage, this is one of the markers, that, one of the historical markers we received because um, Priscilla and Aquila had come, from, uh, had come from Italy and specifically from Rome because Claudius, this is Emperor Claudius, who was emperor between Caligula and Nero. Um, and he had, he had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. The, the, the Roman historian sent, um, um, what's his name? Starts with an S. It'll come to me. Uh, but there was a Roman historian who, who, who said that in 49 AD, Claudius had expelled all the Jews from Rome because there was an uproar in Rome among the Jews. Uh, Suetonius, that's the name I'm trying to think of. That's a Roman historian. Anyway, Suetonius said that uh, there, there was this uproar, and because of the uproar, Claudius had just cleared Rome out from all of these uh, all of these Jews who were in an uproar, riot, basically rioting, fighting each other, and that the uproar was over. Suetonius said, a slave by the name of Crestus. Now, most scholars think that Crestus, and I think this is likely correct, that, that Crestus is a garbled Christ, and that this uproar was probably between the Jews and the Christians in Rome, and it, and it was over the Lord Jesus Christ, but Suetonius, who was no expert in matters having to do with Christianity and Judaism just kind of garbled it. But anyway, they had been expelled from Rome and so they came to Corinth. Uh, but it gives us a date. It means this is after 49 AD and we're gonna have, we'll have another date uh, shortly. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. You said the uproar was be uh, more likely between the Jews and who else? Christians. Christian, okay, okay. 
and, and probably the, the point of dispute was the Lord Jesus Christ. Suetonius knew that there was some kind of a uproar between them, and he probably just garbled Christ and made it and thought it's, it sounds like Christus. Okay. And also the fact that he said that Christus was a slave might fit with the fact that Jesus was crucified because only the worst criminals and slaves could be crucified. So there are reasons why he could distort that without meaning to, just out of ignorance. Okay. Okay, so Paul joined, uh, he, um, he goes to work, he stays with them and goes to work with uh, Aquila and Priscilla because they're tent makers by trade. Um, Jewish rabbis were taught to get a trade. They weren't to be supported by their fellow Jews. They were to work with their own hands and support themselves. So Paul, even before he was a Christian, would have learned some kind of trade. And apparently the trade he learned was tent making. Um, Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers. And so he worked alongside them. And very often, you will notice in Paul's letters, he'll talk about how he supported himself with his own hands and that sort of thing. Um, so he, and sometimes this term is being used, uh, sometimes people have talked about a tent maker ministry, which means, in effect, self-supporting. Um, so he's working as a tent maker six days a week, and on the Sabbath, which is Saturday. Uh, he he went into the um, uh, he went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, and we've seen him do this before. He tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks, and the unspoken is he's persuading them that Jesus is the Christ and that with him came the kingdom of God. Picking up with verse five, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia. Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook his, out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next, to the, next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many people, or I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Okay, Silas and Timothy finally meet up with Paul. They've come, they've come down from Macedonia. Uh, he, was, he was working and, and preaching both. It appears that once they get there, they started supporting the ministry with their own work. And he spent, he was occupied with, with the word, at least that's what it appears to, to me. Um, he, he was testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. Uh, they began opposing him, and he gives up on them. Apparently, this opposition was such that he knew he wasn't going to make any more headway than he had already made uh, with them. and. Um, he shook out his garments, which I take to be similar to knocking the dust off your shoes. I've given up on you. And he says, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent. From now on, I'll go to the Gentiles. So he leaves. He goes to the house of a man by the name of Titus Justus, Gentile, worshiper of God. Uh, he's next door to the synagogue. but. Uh, even though he has 
turn to the Gentiles. Notice verse eight, Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue. So this is a big man in the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. So the whole household believed also. And uh, there were many other Corinthians as well that heard Paul and believed and were baptized. Then uh, Paul had a vision. In the vision, the Lord says to him not to be afraid, to go on speaking, not to be silent. You know, when we're in trouble, when we're receiving a lot of opposition, sometimes it just seems easier to not speak, but we mustn't do that. Um, and, and he gives him this assurance, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. I find, I find that phrase interesting, for I have many in this city who are my people. Were they already his people or were they his people in prospect? They would be his people. It looks to me like that's what it is. But um, anyway, he stays in Corinth for a year and a half. Paul traveled, as, as you know, he, he moved pretty quickly. And so to stay in one place for a year and a half is, uh, is a considerable amount of time for Paul. Oh, also, let me make another point. As I said, Cor Corinth was a fairly good sized city at this point. And um, in the New Testament, and it, it's easy to miss, or at least it was for me, I, I had read Acts many times. And, but if you had asked me what kind of church we're talking about, a city church or a country church, I would have had to really think about it. And probably, I think probably the reason is when, when you look at Jesus, Jesus is out in the countryside going to small villages. He does go to cities, but there's much more emphasis on his out in the countryside, uh, sometimes out in the middle of nowhere or out on a lake, talking about, uh, talking about soil, you know, farmers and, and, and all that sort of thing. So it seems like it's very much a rural setting for Jesus, largely, not totally. But when we come, when we come to Acts, and especially to Paul's missionary journeys, the church is very much an urban, a city church. And, it, and if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. The Roman Empire was a, an empire of cities, much as the United States is today, and um, and 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 if you wanted the most concentrated public, you went to the cities, and and so Paul goes um, goes primarily to cities. Uh, but he's in Corinth for a year and a half teaching. Then we pick up at twelve. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would ha have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, See to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them out of the tribunal. And they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Gallio was proconsul of Achaia. Uh, we know from historical records outside the New Testament that he was proconsul from 51 to 53. So earlier we know that, uh, that the incident with, uh, with Aquila and Priscilla had to have happened after 49, uh, because that's when, that's when Claudius, uh, Emperor Claudius drove the Jews out of, uh, out of Jerusalem. And here, because Gallio is proconsul, of Achaia, when when Paul is brought before him, it's got to be between 51 and 53. So it at least gives us a round number.
Let me double check one thing before I go on. Brother Jim, did you say it was 49 AD for the internet with Priscilla and Aquila? Yes. So definitive that year, it's not a like a range or anything. Yeah, in that case, for Suetonius, according to Suetonius, it was 49 AD when Claudius drove them out. Okay, he was, thank he you. was a fairly, I mean, I, what I would get is he would make a, he would just make a proclamation that all the Jews are to leave Rome because of the uproar. And let me, let me correct my thing about Gallio. It wasn't for 51 to 53, it's 51, 52. So it's a smaller 51, 52 for Gallio. Okay, thank you. We, we've run into uh, we've run into Claudius before. Um, Claudius was not highly respected as far as emperors, but um, because he had a he had a manner, he had a gait that people took to mean he was um, mentally slow, but the very opposite seems to be the case. He he was very sharp. Um, and when confronted with this uproar, which he probably didn't really understand, just that the Jews are fighting each other. And so I can't have that going on in, in the capital city. And so I just make an I just make an edict that they all have to leave. Okay, so Gallio. Paul is brought before Gallio by the Jews, and they accuse him of uh, persuading people to worship God contrary to the law, which isn't exactly a Roman interest, okay? And Gallio says that. If, if, you, if you brought this guy before me for some wrongdoing or vicious crime, then, then I would try him. But as it is, this is a matter of, and his language is interesting. This is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law. If I were guessing, words would be like Christ, kingdom of God, names, Jesus. Um, things having to do with the law. How does how does Jesus fit into this? Is he is he Messiah? That sort of thing, and and Gallio just says that it, this isn't this isn't an area of Roman interest, and um, you 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 make your own decisions. It has to do with your law. It doesn't have to do with Roman law. So he drives them out. Now they beat the the ruler of the synagogue when they go out, and my guess is the reason is he's probably the one that instigated this whole thing, and now they've been embarrassed by the Roman by the Roman proconsul, and that's probably, my guess is that's why they, they beat him. Uh, but Gallio showed no interest in any of it. Picking up at 18, after this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. At Sancria, he had cut his, uh, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow, and they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But by taking, but on taking leave of them, he said, "I will return to you if God wills." And he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed in Caesarea, he went up to greet the church and then went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he departed and went, uh, went from one place to the next throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. <clears throat> okay, oh, I'll make one comment about Priscilla and Aquila. You'll notice when, uh, when we see Priscilla and Aquila or Aquila and Priscilla, the first time they're introduced, it's Aquila and Priscilla. And um, 
after that, sometimes it's Aquila and Priscilla, and sometimes it's Priscilla and Aquila. The, the normal way to do it, to, to designate a couple like this, a married couple, would be that the husband's name would be first. So some people have been puzzled by why, why sometimes, it's not always, but sometimes it's the other way around. Um, it's speculation, but it's very possible that, uh, that Priscilla was from a wealthy or prominent family and that Aquila was not. And so she had a certain social, perhaps financial prominence. Um, but why, why, why sometimes they have the order one way and sometimes another way, we just, we don't really know for sure. Um, at Sincrea, Paul cuts his hair because he's under a vow. This would be something like a Nazarite vow, but he wasn't a Nazarite. And uh, so exactly, uh, this would be a Jewish thing. And um, so, so um, but it's not clear why, um, why he was exactly why he was doing this. Um, it may be connected with the fact that he, he invariably will go back into the synagogue. So uh, he, remember he had uh, Timothy circumcised, not because Timothy had to be circumcised to be a Christian, but because it would make him more, it would make him ex acceptable to the Jews. It wouldn't cause a roadblock. And so Saul, Paul, Saul's, uh, many of his actions seem to have been to placate um, Jewish unbelievers and, and to keep from building barriers unnecessarily, which um, is, a good, is a good principle for us as well. So when he comes to Ephesus, uh, he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And in this case, these Jews were more receptive. They wanted him to stay longer, but he doesn't, and says if it's the Lord's will, he'll he'll return later. Um, then he goes on, and we have him greeting the church, spending time, traveling around Galatia and Phrygia, and strengthening the disciples. Verse 24. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he, was power, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Now we're introduced to Apollos. Uh, he is a Jew from Alexandria. This would be Alexandria, Egypt, which was the second largest city in the empire. And it was a home of many Jews. Um, Apollos comes to Ephesus. He is described as eloquent, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he, he taught accurately things concerning Jesus, though he only knew John's baptism, or the baptism of John. So he's eloquent, he's competent in the scriptures, he's been instructed in some way, he's been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he's fervent, he's a, he's a passionate, eloquent speaker, he spoke and taught things accurately concerning Jesus. But for some reason, he knows only the baptism of John. 
Now, I don't, I don't know why that would be. Why would he know about Jesus but not know about the baptism, Jesus' baptism? Uh, that's unclear. But one of the things that it does bring through is this is a transition period, and we're going to see it here, and we're going to see it, uh, we're going to see it in the next chapter uh, with some disciples, people who are described as disciples, but who are in a position very similar not totally, but somewhat similar to Apollos's. Apollos knows about Jesus. He can speak accurately about Jesus. He can argue from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ, and yet his baptism is John's baptism. And um, John's baptism is not, was not Christian baptism. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but, and that's similar to what's said about Christian baptism, Go back to Acts 2, verse 38. But, but John's baptism was, was not in the name of Jesus. So that's not something that, that's not something Paulus would understand. But I want us also to note this, both this and in the incident that will follow this. Sometimes we can kind of underestimate the power and the influence that John had. Uh, Apollos is from Alexandria, Egypt. The disciples we're going to run into in the next chapter are from Ephesus. And yet both of them have been influenced by, by John. John was a very powerful figure and his his um, mission to prepare the way for the Messiah was uh, was successful and and resonated through or reverberated, I guess I should say, reverberated throughout the uh, apparently throughout the empire. Um, so he's got all these things right, but 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 he, he's got he's got baptism in the name of Jesus wrong. So when Priscilla and Aquila hear him, Rather than denouncing him, debating him, fighting him in some way, they they invite him home. They explain the word of the Lord to him more accurately, and to his credit, he accepts. I mean, who are these people? What do they know? I'm eloquent. I know the scriptures. I'm powerful. I'm passionate. But no, he he accepts the instruction that they receive him receive. And and he goes on preaching now, with a with a more accurate message. Brother Jim, that was something I marveled at when I read that because today it just seems like you can't, if someone is teaching error, or they may not understand something properly, they are almost offended if you try to explain something to them more accurately, almost. And yeah, so I think that that's kind that, of that is one of the. That's one of the marvelous things about Apollos is how open he was to truth. And um, I think it goes both ways. He was open to truth and they made friends. They didn't see him as their enemy, apparently. They invited him home and simply told him, told him truth that he didn't he he, he didn't understand and uh, so i think it, it's a marvelous story marvelous account um when he wished to uh, cross over to achaia the brothers encouraged him the brother the disciples there welcomed him when he arrived he greatly helped those who through grace had believed um, and again we see this he's powerful in refuting the Jews in public and showing the scriptures from the scriptures that the Christ is Jesus. Uh, by the way, um, Apollos is not nearly as well known, of course, as Paul, um, but but he he was a powerful figure in in the early church. And uh, if you read First Corinthians, look at the first chapter. There are um, the Corinthians are all divided up. And they are apparently divided around men who 
are not encouraging their divisions. And so there's there's a there's a Paul party and there's an uh, an Apollos party and a Cephas or Peter party. Okay, uh, this is our man. <laughs> but it says something about Apollos, and in chapter three of First Corinthians, Paul will say, "I watered, Apollos, or no, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase." So he doesn't see Apollos as his enemy or rival or anything they both have their place in the kingdom and in what they're doing in, in the kingdom by the time he writes that okay chapter 19 oh by the way let me just say what we keep seeing throughout here is people who are fervently preaching about jesus that comes over and over again. When they speak to the Jews, they're reasoning from the scriptures. Um, the approach to many of the Gentiles is somewhat different, and yet Gentiles are not all the same any more than Jews are all the same. And uh, we've seen that before. With the Gentiles, you have some who are proselytes, which means they've converted to Judaism. You've got some Gentiles who are God-fearers, which means they haven't converted, but they accept the idea of the one true God, and, and they're attracted to his high moral standards. Um, and both of these Gentile groups would respect the scriptures and would uh, listen to the scriptures. Of course, there are other Gentiles who don't care anything about Jewish scriptures at all, and they're more more like the well they're more like the people in lystra that we saw and the people in athens those are rather different from each other the ones in lystra are more the common ordinary people the ones in athens are the philosophers uh, but in both cases they're resistant and they're not they're not open to scriptures you've got to take a different approach and you'll notice that paul does take a different approach with with both of those, uh, natural philosophy, you might say, um, with the ones from Lystra, and uh, and and philosophical um, uh, arguments with with the Athenians, but for others who are who respect the scriptures and listen to the scriptures. Um, they, they use scripture. And uh, one of the things I found, just as an aside, today sometimes there's this debate about do you use scripture, or do you not use scripture? I, I, think, I think the problem is sometimes that Christians, because we believe the scriptures, we bomb unbelievers with scriptures that they don't, they don't really believe. And um, it sets up a it often sets up a kind of a problem. How, how do you deal with that problem? What I've found is if I'm talking to somebody who doesn't believe the scriptures, um, I try to get them into a study, a biblical study, but I don't, I don't require that they believe that this is the word of God. And what I found is if I can get them into the study, and my, one of my favorite means of doing that is the Gospel of John that I believe was written for to evangelize Hellenistic Jews. I, I won't go into all that now, but I believe it was written for that purpose. And uh, John says, he writes, that you, you'll believe. And what I found is if I can get somebody to study John with me, not, they don't have to accept it as inspired. Just, just, just study it as um, a document from somebody who is an early disciple of Jesus and who believes certain things about him and writes to tell us what he believes about who Jesus was and, and what that means. And I found that there are some people who will be open to making that kind of study. And what I've 
always found this is 100% that doesn't mean it will always be this way but I found in my own experience 100% by the time we get through the end of John they do believe in Jesus and they believe that the scriptures are inspired and that's without me making those arguments I just let John uh, just let the gospel of John do the work so that's my that's my aside on this <clears throat> okay so Paul is in, Paul is now, he's passed through Corinth and he's in Ephesus. Um, chapter 19, verse 1. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak in tongues and prophesying, uh, began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Uh, there, were, there were about 12 men in all. Um, so he runs into some people who are described as disciples, except for this case, disciples is used as the equivalent to Christians. So, um, but the word disciple itself means student, learner, follower, and it seems to be used in a somewhat broader way here. Also, let me say, in the ancient world, the word disciples was used commonly, not just of, not in, just in Christian circles, but the philosophers, for instance, tradesmen had uh, disciples who would imitate the master craftsmen. Uh, for Greek philosophers had disciples who would imitate their philosophy and their lifestyle. Jewish rabbis had disciples who would imitate them. Uh, the fact that Jesus had disciples was not within itself unique. What was unique was the pattern of discipleship. Jesus is the absolutely unique pattern, unlike the philosophers or the rabbis or master craftsmen. And he is the pattern for everything, everything in our lives. But these are disciples, they're learners, but it's obvious they're not Christians yet. When he asks, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They had never heard of the Holy Spirit. And he must have suspected something was going on there. I, I think he wouldn't have asked him that question. And then um, he says, then, into what, what then were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. So we see again that John's, John's teachings are out there, out there circulating in the, in the Roman Empire, and uh, people are becoming disciples of John. Um, and um, and so these people had been baptized, but they weren't baptized in the name of Jesus. And Paul explains to them, and this is, go back to Luke 3, and you'll see the, where this is coming from. He, uh, that John baptized with a baptism of repentance. He was calling them to change their minds and change their lives. Repent. Change directions and go toward God. And not only was it a baptism of repentance, but he told them to believe on the one who would come after him. So John, as we know, was leading to Jesus, but wasn't the he wasn't the end. But he was the he was he was the one who prepared the way for Jesus, and they saw that. So on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of uh, the Lord Jesus. And in something similar to what we've seen with the apostles before, he lays his hands on them and the Holy Spirit comes on them. And similar to what happened in uh, 
Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and what happened with Cornelius, they began speaking in other tongues and prophesying. And it's fascinating to me that it says there were about 12 men. I don't know if that's supposed to be, if that's meant to be symbolic or not. 12 is a 12 apostles, 12 patriarchs, 12 tribes. Uh, it could be that it's uh, it's symbolic in that way. Then picking up at eight, and he entered the synagogue and for months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Okay, he goes into the synagogues for three months. He speaks boldly, and we've seen this before. Reasoning, he speaks boldly, and he's reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God, which inherently has to do with Jesus, the Messiah, um, because he is the king. Uh, he's the messianic king of the kingdom. Um, but there are some people who were stubborn. They continued in unbelief. They spoke evil of the way. Notice in Acts, the way is used as a term for um, the church. Uh, the way, the way of salvation, the way to God. Um, I am tempted to say it also goes back to the words of Jesus in John 14, verse six, I am the way. Uh, there are somewhat unique connections between Luke and John. And so it's possible that, that Luke kn knows that teaching and the, and the way uh, came from that. But Anyway, sometimes that's used as a designation for the church. Um, but there are people who are speaking evil against the way, so he withdraws from the synagogues, and he goes to the Hall of Tyrannus. We have no knowledge of what the Hall of Tyrannus was for sure, but we can make a pretty good guess. It's some kind of a public hall, probably, uh, probably a place where philosophers would make would do their teaching and make speeches. And, and it's probably not just free. Paul and his party probably are paying rent uh, to use the hall. Tyrannus means tyrant. So it's, it's kind of hard to see. I mean, a, a philosopher could own it or somebody else, but uh, you really want to call this guy the tyrant? I don't know, M maybe. Maybe it's a nickname that his students gave him. <laughs> He's a tyrant. <laughs> uh, but anyway, for two years, Paul goes to this hall, probably a philosopher's uh, hall, and uh, continues teaching people. And uh, the word spreads all around the Roman province of Asia so that the Jews and the Greeks hear the word of the Lord. Starting at verse 11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away by, to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you. In the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims, seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastering, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they ran out of the house naked and wounded. And this because, 
and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them, fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also, many of those who were now believers came confessing and uh, d divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it to be 500,000 pieces of silver or no 50, not 500,000, 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Okay, there is this, I think, humorous, I think this is a pretty funny story. Uh, God is working powerfully through, through the Apostle Paul. He's doing miraculous things, so, so much so that a handkerchief or a apron that he's touched, just touched his skin, was carried off to the sick, and they were healed. Uh, they were healed by touching it, or evil spirits came out of uh, them if there were evil spirits. But there are some uh, itinerant Jewish exorcists who who find that Paul's powerful, and this name of the Lord Jesus is powerful, and uh, that could help us in our exorcisms. So they were invoking the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Notice, <clears throat> they're, not came, came, they're not claiming to believe in Jesus. They're just using the name of the Lord Jesus that Paul proclaims. So they're using this as magic. It's not, it doesn't come out of faith in Jesus. <coughs> and I may be drinking that water was a mistake. <coughs> <clears throat> let's see if this works anyway they've used his name as if it's a magic talisman or a magic wand <clears throat> Even though we don't believe he's the Messiah, if we just say his name, the name of the Lord Jesus, who Paul proclaims, um, <clears throat> they think that'll be the name. That'll be enough. Well, they don't say Lord Jesus. They say just say Jesus. Um, <clears throat> and there are these seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva who are doing this but they get more than they're they're bargained for they 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 try this and the evil spirit within a man says Jesus I know and Paul I recognize but who are you and the demon possessed man leaps on them beats them up <clears throat> they run out of the house beaten up and naked um, and this puts fear through people they find that you can't use the name of Jesus as some kind of magic, as some kind of magic. And so his name is extolled. In other words, they hold it in reverence and they, <clears throat> whether they believe or don't believe, they do recognize that the power of this name shows itself uh, in people who who have faith and um, so it is to be respected um, then there is this note that there are many believers who confess and and who are confessing and divulging their practices a number of them 
practiced magic, which I think that's exactly what these Jewish these Jewish men were doing. Um, but <clears throat> you've got these others who I would take probably are mainly pagans, but it doesn't say for sure. But anyway, they're practicing magic arts and they have books. And this has been common throughout history, right? Books with spells and things in them. If you want, if you want somebody to love you, if you want to curse someone, if you want whatever, there will be a spell for that. <clears throat> but now being believers, they realize that magic, see in magic, people are trying to control whatever their belief is. If they believe in God, if they believe in destiny or some kind of some kind of power in the universe. Magic is an attempt to control that, to control the power of God or to control destiny or whatever it is. <clears throat> and that is the very antithesis of believing in God. Nobody controls God. Nobody controls what God will do. You can't use God to get what you want. Um, but a magic orientation does that. Well, th these people realize that faith in the Lord Jesus means that they've got to denounce this magic beliefs that they've had, these magic beliefs. And so they bring these books and they burn them. And, it, <clears throat> and, the, and the books they burn are worth a considerable amount of money, 50,000 pieces of silver. They could have sold them but they're evil. So they wouldn't sell them, they just burn them. And then we've got a note again that we've seen so often. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. No matter what happens, no matter what's going on, the word of the Lord keeps going forward. Okay, picking up now at 21. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem saying, after I have uh, been there, uh, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About this time, there arose a little, no little, disturbance uh, concerning the way for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who, who made silver shrines of Artemis brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, man, you know that from this business, we have our wealth and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that the gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they became enraged and were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And so the city was filled with confusion and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. And when Paul wished to go in among them, among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of uh, the uh, Asiarchs, A Asianarchs, uh, who were friends of his, uh, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now, some cried one th out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. 
and most of the people did not know why they were had had come had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, who was the Jew who had whom the Jews put forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they cried out with one voice, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the, the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, who is there that does not know that the city of, uh, of the Ephesians is, is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who have neither, who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphem, blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. <clears throat> Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we are really, we, we are, we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Okay, Paul uh, is in Ephesus. In Ephesus, there is a silversmith by the name of Demetrius. Demetrius makes, we're told, silver shrines of Artemis. Now, <clears throat> background to this that you need to understand is one of the one of the seven wonders of the ancient world was the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. The temple was huge. If you're familiar with the Parthenon in Athens, it was four times the Parthenon. Parthenon is a big building. The temple of Artemis was four times the size of um, the Parthenon. Uh, it had 127. 60 foot tall pillars. The thing was huge. So it's no wonder that uh, Demetrius could make models of this as a tourist attraction and, and sell them to people and make a good living at it. Quite a good living at it. So he's upset. He talks to his uh, business colleagues he says, this is where we have gotten our wealth. By the way, it, the real motive here is a profit motive. It comes, I think it comes through pretty clearly. Um, but the, there is this Paul who's threatening us, th threatening our business. He's saying that gods made with hands are not gods at all. This is a great danger. <clears throat> it may bring this temple and our goddess uh, Artemis into disrepute and count for nothing and, and our, the unspoken is our income will dry up. And so they, they, start sh they start shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And um, they create a lot of confusion. They rush to the theater and don't think of this as like a, a local movie theater. This was an amphitheater that was uh, built into the side of a mountain and it was huge. So we're talking about a very large theater, uh, amphitheater. Um, so they're shouting, there's this commotion, people rush into the theater, they drag um, Gaius and Aristarchus, who are two of uh, Paul's companions. Um, Paul wanted to go into the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him, and even some of the local uh, government officials 
who are his friends tell him not to go in. Uh, the, the situation's too volatile and too violent. As, as it turns out, the town clerk will take care of things, but they're crying. Some people are crying one thing, some people are crying another. It's just chaos is what it is. Most people don't even know why they're there. Um, some in the crowd prompted Alexander, who was a Jew, to, to uh, speak. But when they find out he's a Jew, they, uh, <clears throat> they won't listen to him. And for two hours, they just shout, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Then the town clerk gets up. Now, the town clerk was the highest non-Roman appointed official. He, he would have been appointed by popular, uh, by the population. Uh, it would be a uh, more or less a democratic election. Um, so he's got, he's got prestige and he's got power, not, not the kind of power that the Romans have, but, but next to the Romans, this is the, this is the greatest authority in the, in the city. <clears throat> He, he he so he he's a powerful figure he gets up he says um, who is there that does not know that the city of ephesus is the temple keeper temple keeper for the great artemis we we have our temple here in other words and we keep the temple um and for the uh sacred stone that fell from heaven there the, there was a myth in Ephesus, that uh, a stone, a kind of image of Artemis had fallen from the heaven. Our best guess is that there was a meteor uh, that landed and they thought it had come from Artemis and so it was their sacred stone. He says, this, none of this can be demo, demo, denied. Uh, you, need to, you need to keep quiet and and do nothing rash he says the, the men that you the men that you're you brought in here have done nothing that was sacrilegious or blasphemous against our goddess if if demetrius and the craftsmen have a problem then they need to go to the courts the proconsuls those would be the roman officials but if you're seeking anything further right here right now it needs to be settled in the regular assembly not not as a mob action is what he's implying. We're in danger of being charged with rioting. And by the way, the, the town clerk was responsible for keeping order. So he's got a big stake in not letting this riot to run rampant. He says there's no good cause for it. There's nothing that will justify this. And if we keep on going like this, uh, we're going to be in danger of, uh, of the Romans, uh, the Roman authorities, uh, considering this a, a riot. Um, and so when he said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Um, the next week we'll pick up, we'll pick up where this leaves off. But what we see again is God is protecting his people and, and he's protecting, the word goes forth. You've got, you've got Jews who reject it. You've got Jews who don't just reject it. They, they commit violence against uh, the people of God. You've got pagans who reject it, pagans who riot, uh, who just irrationally just shout great is God great is Artemis of the Ephesians without really coming to terms with whether it's true or not um, I don't know to you if that sounds familiar or not but today we've got so many people who have this emotional thing going on and they they're not interested in whether it's true it's true because they feel it apparently uh, we're, we live in a very feeling time. Yeah, but that takes also into account um, 
some of the strife that Peter had because of Halakha. I remember part of his struggle was the traditions, the Torah and the customs. And he had to completely shake himself that, no, I can't do this. It was a whole new kind of way of life because of Jesus. Uh, yes, absolutely. So uh, I, I can't even imagine the time for everybody because even some of the Jews that were accepting Jesus, wow, I mean, a complete turn of their world, complete turn. Yep, yes. And that's one of the things that comes through very strongly throughout Acts is uh, <clears throat> conversion is a complete turn. That's a, and uh, that's a reason I keep going back to the word uh, repent, repentance. To repent means you're, you've changed your mind and you change your direction. Sometimes people think of repentance as feeling bad for your sin. That's actually, that's a fruit of repentance, but it's not repentance within itself when it's in itself repentance means i believe this and i was headed in that direction but my mind changed and i head in that direction i was headed away from god whether i was religious or non-religious it doesn't matter it was it was religion or non-religion without god and now i'm i'm moving toward god and whether they were jews or gentiles whether they were whether they believed in the one true god or whether they right. were pagans um well we still do it today we still manipulate it today yeah well it's kind of what i was saying earlier in a sense they lived in an emotional era and we live in an emotional era amen yep those it, it, it's not that different <laughs> no the only I mean, piece is studying the word that's the only piece that you can have is by studying the word yes and when Amen. when it speaks when it speaks over and over of Paul reasoning and persuading from from Scripture, that's what they needed, and it's what we need. We need to keep mm -hmm. going back to Scripture to understand what it actually says, <clears throat> and to uh, to reason from to reason from that. And. Um, it's it's easy whether it's then or now to um, to miss that that's right and but it's it's absolutely vital that we not and that we be willing to follow the the word of the lord wherever it goes that is not cold heartless that is no in scripture god is speaking to us amen yes we, sir. we, we hear his voice and we need to listen to his voice and be obedient and, yes we need to listen to his voice and obey it wherever it takes us and we we saw that with apollos where apollos you know such a powerful character such a uh such a skilled character and um and this couple takes him aside and he listens to them. Talk about lack of ego. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he listens to what they have to say. And they don't, and on the other hand, I go back to <clears throat> they they didn't have ego involved in it either, where okay, we're gonna we're gonna nail him. We're gonna no, they just take him aside and and uh, apparently just calmly gently explain the way of the lord to him and he's open to it and uh, and that's so funny because in our other class we were studying romans 14 and 15 about about having the understanding to walk with righteousness peace and joy during those times of arguing about the disputable matters yes yes Okay, we will have a prayer, and then if you have other questions or comments, I'll be happy to uh, uh, ha happy to hear those. Uh, oh, by the way, um, the um, the take home open book final um, is prepared. I may tweak it again, but I, I plan for it to go out uh, tonight. Or at the or at the latest early tomorrow morning, but it'll probably go out tonight, 
and uh, I think you'll have the the date when it's due and and I all the instructions. But if there's something uh, that's not clear, be sure to uh, be sure to contact me. But let's let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word in a world that's uh, so confused and often so emotional and lacking real serious thought. Father, we thank you that your word comes through clearly and uh, gives us a place to stand and um, something to believe, but most of all, someone to believe in. And we thank you that you came in Jesus and that uh, you have you have touched our lives and you continue to touch our lives and to make a difference in us and in our world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, good night. Good night. Good night, Jim. Good night. Good night, Jim. Good night. Hey, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> just saying hi, I got in late, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, I was just, I yeah. was just, I was just checking your name off. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there I am. I, I didn't realize you were in until toward toward the end. I saw your name popped up, but. Yeah. Yeah. I had a lot going on, so anyway, I'm here and I missed most of it, and that, I, that bothers me. But you know, I caught a little bit of it, so it's always good. Well, and if you want to, it will be online, and you can always. I know it's it's difficult once it's not live anymore but well no it's still there you know so there. but it's still there it's fun to listen to you cough i really enjoy that um <laughs> well, i'm glad <laughs> i can entertain you with my cough. <laughs> all right brother. that love just you. means the world to me <laughs> <laughs> love you brother love you too have a good evening you too Bye -bye. good night